Hello, everybody. Wow, it's good to see you, and it's good to have all of our 16 campuses joining us online. Happy Valentine's Day this weekend, and uh, if you take out your message notes, I want us to look at growing a love that lasts, growing a love that lasts a lifetime. Now, in your life, there will be many things that change over your lifetime, particularly the way you look. <laughs> Have you looked in a mirror lately? You're not no spring chicken anymore, baby. Uh, that's a positive way to start off, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Go home. That's all you need to hear this week. Thank you very much. Over your lifetime, there's a lot of things that are going to change in your life, some for good, some for bad. But there's one thing that's never, 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 never going to change in your life, and it is God's unconditional, un relenting, undiminished, everlasting love for you. That is what you can build your life on. That's a foundation for a stable life. God's love is reliable. It is unchangeable. It is consistent. It is dependable. It's steadfast. It's unwavering. It's enduring. The fact that God will never, never, never love me any more than he does in this moment and he will never, never, ever love me any less than he does in this moment, means that God's love for you and for me is everlasting. That's the way God loves you. But he doesn't stop there. He then says this, and here's the hard part. I want you to love everybody else the exact same way. Hello? What? No, 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 I want the conditional love for me to give out. You, you gotta earn my love. No, God says, I want you to love with a love that lasts on and on and on. John chapter 15, if you pull out your message notes, the very first verse, Jeremiah 31 verse three, God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I loved it in the message paraphrase. I've never quit loving you and I never will. You can build your life on that verse right there. But then, here's the hard part, John 15, I command you to love each other uh, by the way, in the same way that I love you. Hmm. How in the world do you do that? How do you practice everlasting love? I mean, is it even possible to have everlasting love? Today in America, the divorce rate is 41% for first-time marriages. It's 60% for second-time marriages. And the divorce rate for third-time marriages is 73%. The, the, the track record gets worse it gets worse. Now the truth is anybody can fall in love. It, it, you know, it's like falling in a ditch. <laughs> I fell in love. <laughs> anybody can fall in love, but it takes a whole lot more to stay in love. Everybody want to agree with that one? Okay, it's a whole lot harder to stay in love than to fall in love. And the reason is because it includes choices. You have to make some tough choices in order to stay in love. And you have to make those choices over and over and over and over and over. And this Valentine's weekend, I want us to look at that from God's word. I mean, is it even possible to have a love that lasts an entire lifetime? Let me just take a little survey here. If you have been married 25 years or longer, would you stand up right now? Okay, look at this, 25 years or longer, look at this, okay? Congratulations, I honor you. Now, if you have been married over 40 years, stay standing. Look at this, 40 years. All right. Thank you. Now, if I were to ask each of these, you may be seated, if I were to ask each of these people who've been married 40 years or longer, was it easy, what do you think they'd say? Uh, uh, of course not. Kay and I last year had our 40th anniversary. I rolled over in bed in the morning. I said, I'm proud of you, honey. She said, I'm tired of you too. <laughs> <laughs> the hearing is the first thing to go, you know. But uh, Mark Twain said, you don't really know the depths of real love till you've been married 25 years. Uh, you can get along on good looks for five or six. 
I'm no prophet, but I can tell you two things about the people who just stood. Number one was their love. They've been married 25 years or longer. Their love has been tested by doubt and depression and despair and differences and disagreements and disappointments and defeats. And their love has been tested by distance and it's been tested by delays and dead ends and by debt and by disease and by demands on their life because you don't, it's not easy to stay together. These are what I call the big D's, doubt, despair, death, you know, disease, all these things, but they avoided the big D, divorce. They, they, they made it over that one. And the reason they made it over that one is because they made some tough choices. These choices are not always popular, they're not always easy, they're certainly not convenient. But the fact is, and I've told you this many times, love is a choice. Love is not a feeling. Love produces feelings. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, it produces some great feelings, but love is not a feeling. If love were a feeling, God could not command it because you can't command a feeling. It's like telling a little kid who's crying, I command you to be happy. I'm trying, Daddy. <laughs> you can't force the feelings, feelings are just there. Okay. You can't command a feeling. Love is not a feeling, it produces feelings. Love is a choice. You choose to love. And if you stop loving, that's your choice. Don't blame anybody else. You chose to stop loving. Love is a choice. And you choose to love or you choose to not love. How do you grow a love that lasts a lifetime? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 says this. Four things about love. Four choices we need to make. Love never stops being patient. Never stops believing, never stops hoping, and never gives up. That's everlasting love. That's the kind of love God has for you. It's the kind of love God wants you to have for other people. And so this weekend, Tom and I want to share with you these four choices. Let's get right into it. Number one, the first choice for a lasting love is that lasting love extends grace. Lasting love extends grace. I want to spend the most time on this point because the longer you are married, the easier it is to become ungracious. You just start getting a little bit more critical as time goes on, taking each other for granted. Every day, if you're going to have a love that lasts, you've got to choose to be merciful, choose to be loving, choose to be gracious, choose to forgive, choose to be patient, choose to cut people slack. No relationship, whether it's marriage or any other, no relationship is going to last without grace, without a little bit of forgiveness, without a lot of acceptance and a lot of patience. In any long-term relationship, you have to put up with a lot, right? I saw some elbows jab just then. <laughs> um, now, let's just admit it. It's easy to show grace one time. You hurt me one time, that's no big deal. I can forgive you for that. I'm a big enough guy. I, I, you know, It's no big deal to forgive a person, to show grace, to show patience one time. It's that thing that goes on and on and on and on and on and just irritates you no end. But the Bible says this, love never stops being patient. The message says love puts up with anything. The Bible says love patiently accepts all things the Bible says love is always ready to make allowances. Now, when do I need to extend grace to the people in my life? Three important times. You need to write these down. Three important times you need to work on, and this is a choice you're going to have to make every day of your life. If you're going to have your relationships last, showing grace. The first is I'm going to have to show or extend grace when their flaws and their faults irritate me. I heard a murmur in the land just now. <laughs> when their flaws and their faults irritate me. Now, the longer you love somebody, the more you know their flaws. And you can either be critical or you can be gracious. You can be picky or you can be kind. You can be a perfectionist or you can show mercy. The reason why grace is essential in any relationship is because we're both in that relationship imperfect. You're a sinner, they are a sinner. We're, we're together, two sinners can't create a perfect relationship. 
It is impossible and foolish to think that two imperfect people could create a perfect relationship. It isn't gonna happen. So grace has to be at the foundation of every single human relationship between parents and children, brothers and sisters, moms and dads, husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, employees and employers, coworkers, and on and on and on. We need grace. Proverbs 17, verse nine. Disregarding another person's faults preserves love. I love that. I, I remember hearing one time a, a lady talking to another lady in church, and she said, um, do you remember when your husband did that? And she was talking about a bad thing that happened. And I loved what this woman said. She said, I distinctly remember forgetting that event. <laughs> That's a choice. I distinctly remember forgetting that event. Why? Because love disregards Love disregards another person's fault. That preserves love. Ephesians 2, 4, or 4, 2. Be humble and gentle uh, by being patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Circle the phrase making allowances. Now, notice it says, be humble, be gentle, and, um, and it says, um, be loving because of your love. Do you consider yourself to be a loving person? You'd say, probably, yeah, I do. Do you consider yourself to be a humble person? Yeah, I just wrote a book on it, it's a bestseller. Uh, <laughs> how to be humble like me. Um, do you consider yourself to be a gentle person? Well, the truth is, you're none of those if you're critical of other people's fault, faults and flaws. You are not humble if you are critical of other people's faults and flaws. You are prideful. Every time you criticize somebody's faults and somebody's flaws, you are being prideful. You are not being gentle, and you certainly are not being loving. Because love is patient. Love puts up with anything. Love patiently accepts all things. Love is always ready to make allowances. Everybody needs an allowance. The rest of your life, you're gonna need a grace allowance in all of your relationships. Kay knows that there are two times of a week when she needs to make special allowance for me. The first is Saturday afternoon when I get PMS. <laughs> Pre-message syndrome. <laughs> I'm just going, oh God, this is not good enough. Oh, these people need something better than this. Surely somebody could teach this better than me. Why don't you get somebody who really knows how to do this? And I'm always going through this every week going, you know, pre-message syndrome. And then the other time she shows grace is on Monday when I'm recovering <laughs> after all of the multiple services uh, of the weekend. But she makes allowances. When other flaws and faults irritate me, then I need to extend grace. Another time is when their words or actions hurt me. Now the truth is because we're human beings we hurt each other, sometimes intentionally. But the truth is a lot of times we hurt each other unintentionally. We, ter we say things we don't mean, we say things off the cuff, we do things, we, we're not thoughtful, we're thinking about ourselves, we're not intentionally uh, uh, trying to be hurtful, but often we're careless with our words and with our actions. And the reason why we're careless is because we're not paying attention. We're not paying attention to other people's lives. You might write this on your outline, grace listens. Grace listens. The reason why we, we hurt each other is because we're not really listening to each other. God gave you two ears and one mouth. You know that means you listen twice as much as you talk. The first duty of love is to listen. I'll say it again. The first duty of love is always to listen. The number one organ for showing love is your ear. It's listen, when you look at people in the eye and you listen to them with your ear, you're saying, I value you. And that says, I love you. And it makes you gracious. The problem we have in all our relationships is we talk too much and we listen too little. You know, I grew up in the country and we actually had a lake behind our house and it was filled with French frogs who would croak every night. Did you know that bullfrogs, when they croak, they have a muscle uh, in their throat that when they croak, that muscle cancels that frequency to their brain. They can't hear how obnoxious they are. 
we're a lot like bullfrogs. We don't realize how obnoxious we are when we're talking, 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 and we're not listening, and we can't even hear it. Now, I used to do marriage counseling. I, I can't do it anymore because our church is just so big. But when I did, the, the single most important marriage advice I could give you for the rest of your life is the next verse. James chapter one, verse 19, it's up here on the screen. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. If every married couple followed that verse, 95% of all the arguments wouldn't happen. Usually, we're quick to speak, and we're slow to listen, and then we're fast to anger. Now, if you do the first two, the third is automatic. If you are quick to listen, and if you are slow to speak, you will be slow to get angry. That's a choice. It's not an easy choice. It's not a convenient choice. But that's a loving choice. It's an unselfish choice. And if you want to have a love that lasts forever, you've got to learn how to be quick to listen and slow to speak. So slow to have, slow to be angry. Now, if you want a love that lasts, you can't get hold on to those, those angers. You can't hold on to your hurts. A lot of people, when they get hurt in a relationship, they stockpile them for ammunition. They not only stockpile, they not only remember every hurt they've done, they categorize them. They inventory them. They get them all ready, so then later when they do a mistake, they go, well, you did this, but 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 you did this. I was talking to a lady the other day, and she said, man, uh, you know, I did something wrong, and my husband got historical. I said, you mean hysterical? No, he said, no, no, historical. He told me everything I've ever done wrong. The Bible says love keeps no record of wrongs. You gotta let it go. Proverbs 9, 17, verse nine. Love forgets mistakes. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. If you, wanna, you want your marriage to last, you gotta eliminate nagging. It doesn't work. It's never changed into anybody. Which is, by the way, why I don't nag you. Nagging doesn't work in the home. It doesn't work from the pulpit. Every week I could get up here and tell you everything you're doing wrong, because I know it. I see you. I read your mail. And, and I could get up here and I could just nag you every week. Has nagging ever changed anybody? No, it doesn't. It's worthless. It doesn't work in church, it doesn't work at home, it doesn't work at school, it doesn't work at work, it doesn't work anywhere. Nagging parts the best of friends. The Bible says love forgives all offenses. And there on your outline, Proverbs 19, 11, when someone wrongs you, it is a great virtue to what? Circle that. Ignore it. Just ignore it. That's extending grace. You extend grace when they, their flaws and their faults irritate you, and you extend grace when their words or actions hurt you. And then the third time you show grace is when they sin. And your marriage partner is going to sin, sometimes against you, sometimes just against God, sometimes against others. First Peter. 4 verse 8 says this, let your love for one another be intense. Let your love for one another be intense because love covers over a multitude of sins. It doesn't make a big deal about it. It forgives. Colossians, look at the next verse, 313. Put up with each other and forgive each other as quickly and as completely as the Lord forgave you. A great marriage is simply the union of two great forgivers. Kay and I have a great marriage. Watch, she's a great forgiver. I've learned to be a great forgiver. And a great marriage is not a perfect marriage, it's a marriage of two great forgivers. Now I want you to write this down there on your outline. I must choose to extend grace over and over. I must choose to extend grace over and over and over and over. It's, it's a daily thing. It's not like once in a lifetime. It's over and over and over. And once you write that down, I must choose to extend grace over and over. I want you to think of maybe a name you might show that to this week. Who could you show grace to? Whose falls and faults irritate you and whose words are actions have hurt you or they, they've sinned and you just need to let it go. 
Lasting love extends grace. Now, turn your outline over, and on the back of the outline, the second part is that lasting love not only expresses or extends grace, it expresses faith. That's the second thing God teaches us from 1 Corinthians 13. Lasting love expresses faith. Now, what, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about that when you really love somebody, you believe in them. You have faith in them. You trust them. You build their confidence. You, you relieve their fears. You, your trust causes them to blossom. Faith causes people to blossom. Now, again, this is, a tri- uh, this is a choice. You have to choose to trust people. Love never stops believing, the Bible says. Love always trusts the Bible says. Love never loses faith, the Bible says. See, faith and love are intertwined. In fact, love is built on trust. Now, I want you to listen real carefully. If you can't learn to trust people, you will never learn to love, and you will never learn to be loved, because love and trust go together. A lot of people think they got a love problem. What you really have is a trust problem. Love and trust go together. And love is trust. And when you trust people, you are loving them. And the Bible says love always trusts. Love always believes. Love expresses faith. You know, Delilah got a lot of things wrong. That was the girlfriend of Samson. But she did get this one right. And in the next verse, Judges chapter 16, she says to Samson, how can you say I love you when you don't trust me. Well, she got it. Love and trust are two sides of the same coin. Now, if you're gonna build a love that lasts forever, you gotta learn to trust people. You gotta learn to be more trusting. Now, there are three kinds of people in the world. There are uh, gullible people who trust everything. They believe everything, everything that's told them. They, They believe it everything gullible people. There are cynical people who believe nothing. They don't trust anybody. They're cynical. And then there are loving people who give you the benefit of the doubt. That's love. Now, question. Do you think it's wise or do you think it's foolish to trust people? That's going to say an awful lot about your future happiness, how you answer that question. It's a question that was asked many years ago in uh, the magazine Psychology today, and they did an article called Trust and Its Consequences. And there's this guy, Dr. Julian Rotter of the University of Connecticut, and this guy spent years studying the impact of trust on your behavior, on your personality, and on your relationships. And he studied it for like 35 years, the impact of trust on your behavior, your relationships, and your personality. And he developed a very famous scale, it's quite well known now, to determine a person's level of trust. And then he cross-referenced it to 10 different kinds of patterns in life. And here's what he discovered. The genuinely trusting people, not skeptical people, not gullible people, not cynical people, but genuinely trusting people are, number one, consistently less gullible than distrusting people. Two, have a higher IQ than distrustful people. Three, are far better adjusted psychologically than distrustful people. And four, live much happier lives. Studies have shown over and over and over again that it's actually better to be too trusting than it is to be too distrustful. You'll actually harm yourself uh, less by being too trusting than by being too distrustful. Why? The Bible says love always trusts. It expresses faith. You know, to me, one of the most interesting verses in the Bible is this next verse on your outline. Mark chapter six, verse five and six, and it says this. Jesus has gone to this town and it said, Jesus could not do many mighty works there in this town. I'm talking about miracles, healings, things like that. Jesus could not do many mighty works there because of their lack of faith. Now notice, this is really interesting. It's not Jesus' lack of faith that prevented the miracles. It's not Jesus' lack of faith that prevented the healings. It's not Jesus' lack of faith from 
preventing all these good blessings from happening. It was the lack of faith of the people who were there. It was their unbelief. It was their lack of trust. You see, if that's true of Jesus, it's really true of you. When people don't trust you, you can't do as much. When you don't feel the trust of other people, you're not as empowered, you're not as liberated, you're not as uh, uh, blossoming. And when you don't trust other people, you limit them. You hold them back. If this is true of Jesus, the Son of God, it's certainly true of you, and it's certainly true of me, that we are held back by the distrust of other people. When people don't believe in us, when people don't trust us, when people don't you know, uh, show confidence in us, and yet the Bible says love trusts. You want a love that lasts forever? You need to trust your mate. You need to build their confidence. You need to build their faith. You need to show faith in them. If somebody believes in you, it is amazing what you can do. Kay and I have been a pretty effective team in our lives. And one of the big reasons is not that we're talented, it's that we really believe in each other. I believe in her, and she believes in me. And I remember when Kay and I first got married, she was so shy that she would not do a Bible study in a small group. Now she speaks before thousands and millions of people. She's spoken before you know, Congress and the United Nations and things like that. And, and she goes all over the world speaking. But when I first met her, she was shy, retiring, and the first little Bible study she did in this church, she said her knees knocked the whole time for 45 minutes as she was teaching five or seven women in our little apartment. But I believe in my wife. And all of my life I have decided that love believes. Love encourages. Love says you can do this. And I've watched her do what she thought she could not do. And I've watched her become a world class leader and speaker. And it's her love and trust in me. You know that famous story from Fort Worth 35, 36 years ago when I walked into the bedroom of the little house we were renting in Fort Worth and said, hey, honey, I think God's calling us to go to Saddleback, go to the Saddleback Valley. You've never heard of it. But we're gonna, I, I think we should move to Southern California and start a church with no money, no members, no friends, no building, and I don't know anybody, and I've never been a pastor. What do you think? <laughs> and the famous line of my wife was, well, I believe in God and I believe in you, so let's go for it. Yeah. She actually, actually said it this, it scares me to death, but I believe in God and I believe in you, so let's go for it. And how would history be different if my wife hadn't said, let's go for it? It just causes me to wonder what your loved one might have accomplished in life if you had believed in them more. What your wife could have accomplished if you had trusted her more. What your husband could have done in life if you had said, I'm behind you 100% on this. It scares me to death, but I believe in God and I believe in you, let's go. We limit people by our unbelief. That is unloving. If you want a love that lasts forever, if you want a love that lasts forever, you gotta extend grace because we all need it. But you've also gotta express faith. Express faith. To be trusted is the greatest gift of love. You wanna show love this week? Trust people. Romans 14, 19, let us always be seeking the ways that lead to peace. Let us always be seeking the ways in which we can support each other. Now, I know what some of you think, but Rick, they've let me down so many times. The Bible says love never loses its faith. Okay, they'll let you down. Love never loses its faith. Coaches, any coach will tell you, the best way to restore confidence after a guy has dropped the ball or fumbled the ball is given the ball on the next play. 
Get right back out there. Show you trust the guy. He just made a major fumble. Hand him the ball on the next play and let him show that it was just a fluke. Everybody stumbles. Everybody screws up. Everybody messes up. Hand him the ball again. Say, I believe in you. Let's go for it. How do you make somebody trustworthy? He said, my husband's not trustworthy. My wife's not trustworthy. How do you make somebody trustworthy? You trust them. How do you let somebody, how do you make somebody a leader? You let them lead. People blossom when you trust, when you say, I believe you could do this. I, I believe you could do this. Now, I know what some of you think. You say, Rick, you don't know my situation. My spouse has violated every rule of trust in the book. What do you do when you cannot trust your spouse? Here's what you do. You trust God. You trust God. When you can't trust your spouse because they have violated every rule known to mankind, you trust God. And you say, God, you're greater than my spouse and I'm gonna trust you to work in her or his life. And before you give up on the relationship, give God a chance. Give God a chance to change you and give God a chance to change your spouse. Psalm 62, verse eight, trust God all the time. Tell him all your problems because God is your protection. Your spouse is not your protection, God is your protection. Trust God all the time. Tell him your problems. Don't tell them to your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or whoever that is, the guy at work. Tell them to God because God is your protection and God specializes in miracles and God can transform anything and I've seen it thousands of times in this church. You know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the, uh, the famous poet said, whoever loves believes the impossible. Why? Because love not only extends grace, love expresses faith. It never stops believing, it always trusts, it never loses faith. I want you to write down, I must choose to express faith in people every day. You wanna be a great lover? I must choose to express faith in people every day. Every time you express faith in people, somebody around you, you are showing love to that child, to that coworker, to that spouse, to that friend. I must choose to express faith in people every day. And then you might wanna write down a name that you can practice that with this week. Love, real love, lasting love, everlasting love, extends grace and expresses faith. The third thing this verse says, 1 Corinthians 13, seven, it's all in one verse is that lasting love expects the best. Lasting love, everlasting love expects the best. It's hopeful, it's forward looking, it's optimistic, it's, it's not stuck in the past. The Bible says love never stops hoping. The Bible says love always expects the best. The Bible says love always looks for the best. And here's the problem. The longer you're in a relationship with an imperfect people, person, you tend to expect the worst, not the best. Because you know their downside better than anybody else. And when you start expecting the worst of your husband, you start expecting the worst of your wife, you are setting yourself up for self-fulfilling prophecy. You're setting them up. Study after study after study after study has shown that we tend to act in ways that the people we most value think we're gonna act. In other words, people tend to fulfill what we think they expect us to think of them. And they fulfill that expectation it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. This has been told in a thousand stories, My Fair Lady, Pygmalion, and every other one. I've got a friend, Bruce Wilkinson, who you know wrote the book, The Prayer of Jabez, and uh, many years ago, Bruce was hired as a first-year professor at Multnomah University up in, uh, in the, the Northwest. And when he got there, they said, we're giving you uh, two uh, English classes and their advanced, their advanced placement classes. He goes, oh, this is great. I get the brightest kids. I get the sharpest kids. 
And he said, you know what? It, it was true. These kids were sharp as a tack. He said they asked great questions. They had great answers. Uh, they, were, they were smart. They thought things through. Uh, at the end of the semester, everybody in both of those classes got A's or B's. He said it was amazing how great these kids were. And he said, on the last day of school, I went in and sat down in the faculty lounge. He goes, well, I sure I hope I get those classes again next year. And one of the other professors said, what class? He said, oh, the two advanced placement classes. He said, Bruce, there are no advanced placement classes in this school. It had all been a setup. Because he thought they were advanced placement, he treated them that way. And when he treated them that way, guess what? They rose to the occasion. People tend to rise to the level of expectation. What are you expecting from your husband? What are you expecting from your wife? What are you expecting from your kids? What are you expecting from yourself? We tend to fulfill the expectations around us. You don't change bad behavior into good behavior by telling somebody they're bad. You change bad behavior by helping them see a picture of what they could become. Somebody could say to me, Rick, you, you're not good at this, you're not good at this. I go, yeah, you're right. Let me show you how bad I am at it. But if they came to me and say, you know, Rick, I think you could really be good at this. If you just do this, you, you could be this. You could be a man that your wife honors and loves, that the community respects, uh, that your friends and, and, uh, and, and relatives want to be around. This is the kind of man you could be if you would really give your heart fully, 100% to Jesus Christ. That gets me excited, not telling me. You know, people say, I, I've heard preachers say, well, I just tell it like it is. Well, that's a lousy way to preach. Because telling it like it is only reinforces the negative. You can hear that on TV every day. I don't tell it like it is, folks. I tell it like it could be. That's preaching for faith. That's preaching for expectation. That's preaching for what God wants to do in your life. So here's the key. You want to be a great lover? Treat people the way you want them to become. You want your wife to treat you like a king? Treat her like a queen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, if you love somebody, I love this in the living, if you love somebody, you'll always be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You'll always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending him. First Thessalonians 5.11, encourage each other and build each other up. Do you know what Satan's favorite four words are? You can't do it. Satan loves to say that to people. He whispers it in your ear thousands of times in your lifetime. You can't do it. So every time you encourage somebody, you are defeating Satan in their life. Every time you just encourage them. You can do it. You can do it. Do you know what is the number one killer of love in marriage? It's not financial debt. It's not adultery. It's not anger. It's not hatred. The number one thing that kills marriages is neglect. It's neglect. If I knew this was the last time I'd see you fall asleep, I'd tuck you in more tightly and pray your soul to keep. If I knew this was the last time I'd see you out the door, I'd hug and I'd kiss you one more time and call you back for more. If I knew this was the last time I'd get to share your day, I know that I'd make certain it didn't slip away. We assume we'll always have tomorrow to correct an oversight. That we'll always have another chance to make everything all right. There will always be another day to say that I love you. There will always be another chance to ask, what can I do? But just in case that I might be wrong, today is all I get. I want to say that I love you so that you will not forget. Tomorrow is not promised that we'll see another night. Today could be 
my last chance to love and hold you tight. Instead of waiting for tomorrow, show your love somehow, for if tomorrow never comes, you'll wish you'd done it now. That you didn't take the extra time for a smile, a hug, or a kiss. Instead, you were too busy with that one that you now miss. Hold your loved ones close today, whisper in their ear, tell them that you love them, and why you hold them dear, and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, you're the best, and it's okay. So if tomorrow never comes, you will not regret today. As a pastor who's done thousands of funerals, I've just seen that one in spades. Too little, too late. If you're gonna give flowers, give them while they're alive. Don't wait for the funeral. I want you to write this down. I must choose to expect the best from them every day. I must choose to expect the best from them every day. And then I want you to write down the name of somebody that you could choose to expect the best from this week. Because lasting love extends grace. And lasting love expresses faith. And lasting love expects the best. And finally, the fourth thing this verse tells us in God's word is, and this is not, see this is not self-help advice I'm giving you, this is from the Bible. This is what God says makes love. Lasting love, it doesn't just expect, it doesn't just extend, it doesn't just express, it endures. Lasting love endures the worst. And this is where a lot of people fall out. It is persistent, it is determined, it is diligent, it is resolute, it refuses to quit, it is stubborn. The Bible says it like this in verse seven. Love never gives up. The Bible says love endures through every circumstance. The Bible says love always perseveres. The Bible says love never looks back but keeps going to the end. When Kay and I got married, at 21 years of age. We closed the escape hatch on our marriage and we threw away the key. And we said, we are in this for life. We're gonna make this work if it kills us. It nearly did. <laughs> Kay and I have been married 40 years, 38 wonderful years. The first two years were hell on earth. And um, many of you know this story that uh, I, was, I was making, uh, what was it, $400? No, no, I think I was making $800 a month uh, uh, teaching at a college. And uh, we were so miserable in our marriage, we said we're gonna go get counseling. And I never understood people say, I can't afford counseling. How much is your happiness worth? So we went out and we spent for 15 weeks $100 a week for counseling. That's what it cost. And I was making, you know what, $200 a week. So half my income was going to counseling. I've often thought I should do, we put it on a MasterCard, $1,500. I've thought I should do a MasterCard commercial. A saved marriage, priceless. <laughs> I'd pay a million bucks for what I got today. My wife's my best friend, my lover, my partner, my companion, my ministry associate. I can't imagine, there would be, you wouldn't even be here. There would be no Saddleback Church if our marriage had fallen apart. That was the best 1,500 bucks I ever spent. You can't afford not to get counseling if you're going through a tough time. I would encourage you. Love, the Bible says, never gives up. It always endures through every circumstance. It always perseveres. It never looks back. Some of you 
are in a marriage right now that's not very happy and you are ready to give up and I came here as a man of God to tell you this, don't. Don't you do it. You have no idea what you'll miss. It is always more rewarding to restore a relationship than to run from it. It is always more rewarding to restore a relationship than to run from it. I know people who gotten divorced and got remarried in this church. I'll give you a dozen examples of that one. I know what some of you are saying. Rick, you just don't know I have endured so much pain. Well, don't waste it. Don't say, well, I put up all this pain, so I just then ran away from it. At least get something from it. I was in a Rouse grocery store this week, and a woman came up to me and she said, you know, Pastor Rick, 10 years ago, my marriage was on the rocks, and we were headed for disaster, and destiny was divorce court. And I started coming to Saddleback Church, and I would come to the Sunday night service at Lake Forest where on Sunday nights you would have pastors of the church line up at the front and after the service was over, anybody who wanted prayer could come down and receive prayer from one of the pastors of the church. She said, I was there every week, month after month after month. Those prayers saved my marriage. It says 10 years later, we're happily in love. Things are going great. I'm so glad we didn't quit. It's always more rewarding to restore a relationship than to run from it. Now, I don't know why, but I want to just close with two verses, and I don't know who these verses are for, but these are the last two verses I want to share with you. Hosea 3.1. Then the Lord said to Hosea, go and get your wife again. Bring her back to you and love her, even though she loved adultery. I don't know who that's for, but that's for somebody. And then others of you, some of you have a spouse, or you've got a friend, uh, or you've got uh, a loved one, or a partner, or somebody who's walked away from God. And they have walked away from God, so I don't even believe in God anymore. And God says, I do not want you walking away from them. They need you now more than ever. Let me show you a couple verses that'll blow your mind. Look at this verse on the screen. Job 6, verse 14, this is the Bible. A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. Leave that verse on the screen for just a minute. You know what this verse says? When you are in such a place, you go, I don't even know if I believe in God right now. I am in so much pain. I don't even know if I believe in God. You need a small group that goes, that's okay. We'll believe God for you. We'll just hang on to you. Lay down on the stretcher, we'll carry you on the stretcher. A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. When a friend, a husband, a wife, or somebody walks out on God, you do not walk out on them. They deserve the devotion of the friends even though we forsake the, let me, let me look, last verse on your outline is the same verse in another translation. When desperate people give up on God, Almighty, their friends at least, should stick with them. And that's a verse for somebody here today too. Now I want you to notice that these four things, these loving choices, extending grace, expressing faith, expecting the best, enduring the worst, you know what these are? This is how Jesus loves you. This is how Jesus loves you. Jesus extends grace to you. He died for you. Jesus expresses faith in you. You say, how's that? Well, in the first place, he gives you the freedom to make choices. And that's risky, because you could reject him. He doesn't force you to love him. He gives you the freedom of choice. He express, expresses faith in you. He expects, expects the best from you. He knows your potential. Nobody knows it more than God does. And he never gives up for you. Never gives up on you and he's waiting for you to come home. Some of you have been away from God for a long time. You're coming home to this weekend, today, right now. It's time to come back to God. Now let me give you a little secret. 
if this is the way God loves you, this is the way Jesus loves you, if you want to learn to love people the way Jesus loves, here's the secret. Get Jesus in you. Ask God to put the spirit of Jesus Christ in you. Nobody can be Jesus like Jesus. So you don't need to imitate him, you just need to inhabit him and let him inhabit you. And only with him in your life will you ever be able to treat people the way that God says everlasting love does. Let's bow our heads. Father, I know that there are many people hurting here today. There are people who are lonely and they want desperately somebody to love them. They want to love and be loved and we, we honor that. And I ask you to bring somebody in their life that would cherish them and give them that love that they, they deserve and they need. I know that you love them. I know that this church loves them. I know this is the family that loves. But we ask you to bring people into the lives of those who want to love and be loved. And Lord, whether we ever marry or not, we need to learn this lesson of love because you've called us to love everybody, even our enemies, even the foreigner, the immigrant, the, the people who are different from us in religion, lifestyle, Lord, we are not allowed to not love anybody if we claim your name. I pray that we would feel your grace so we can extend it to others. I pray that we would understand the freedom that you've given to us so that we may express that faith and freedom to others. Thank you, Lord, that you don't drag us down and nag us down, but you build us up. Help us to do that with others. Thank you that you've never given up on us. God, I thank you that Kay and I never gave up on our marriage, but I'm more thankful that you never gave up on our marriage. And for those who are just teetering and wavering right now, some who are on the verge of an affair, some of them are out in a full-blown one right now, Bring them back to you lovingly in a new sense. Make Saddleback Church be known as that's the place where they build marriages, where they build relationships, where they build families, where they build friendships, where they build small groups, where people learn the relational skills they didn't learn in school or at home or anywhere else. If you've never opened your life to Jesus Christ, you can't do this. So you need to say this, Jesus Christ, as much as I know how, I ask you to put your love in my life. To say that Jesus Christ, as much as I know how, I ask you to put your love in my life. Take away the distrust and fill me with trust. Take away the shame and guilt and fill me with grace. Take away the cynicism and the hurt and fill me with faith. Take away the despair and fill me with hope. And even when I have to endure the worst, Lord, would you give me the strength to go through the valley of the shadow of death and to fear no evil. With their heads bowed, if you prayed that prayer, God heard you. And I'm gonna ask you to let me know about your decision if you really meant it in just a minute. Take the bulletin and on the flap you can check the box, I committed my life to Christ and check that and drop it in the basket and I'll send you some information. Father, thank you for those who are making decisions for you today. We commit them to you in your name. Amen. Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. 
We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.